In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make some basic changes to your images within Adobe Camera Raw. What I love about Adobe Camera Raw is that it will take me minutes to show you how to do it, as opposed to Photoshop that will take hours. Now, one of the big differences between working in Adobe Photoshop and Camera Raw is this. If I was to show you how to use Adobe Photoshop with any level of competency, it would take me about five to seven hours to actually do that till you're comfortable enough learning Adobe Photoshop. However, with Camera Raw, it literally takes minutes. I can show you how to use the entire program from beginning to end in about 40 minutes. And simply working that way will totally take your images to a whole new level. Now I've taken this image and I dragged it and dropped it in Photoshop and it opened it up inside of Camera Raw. People ask me what I start working with first color changes or tonal changes. And basically, I take each image on its own individual basis. For example, when you look at this image, what do you see needs to be done? What is the most obvious thing that could be corrected with this? In this particular case, it's likely the fact that their skin tones are blown out, as well as her hair. So if we want to make this change, it is so easy inside of Camera Raw. Simply grab the highlights and pull them down, and all that detail comes back. Now, you can hear what you're saying. Well, that's great, but how do I know that highlights was going to do that? Here's how I like to describe this first section here to my students. Now, notice inside of this dialog, we have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. So let me show you how this works. Here we have a tonal range that goes from absolute black to absolute white with shades of gray in between. Absolute black is 100% black and 0% of black is white. Over here we have a 75% gray which is otherwise known as the three quarter tone. Here we have a 50% gray. Here is a 25% gray also known as a quarter tone. And together all this makes up the tonal range of an image if it were to be viewed in black and white, devoid of all color. So with this chart in mind, you can look at this section and start making some obvious correlations between the two. Blacks is the absolute black, 100%. Whites is the absolute white, which has nothing, which is devoid of color. So then we have highlights. If I were to move this highlights back, you can see what happens the lighter parts around the 25% gray get darker. Or if I go the other way, they get lighter. So if you actually look at it, notice that the highlights running in this general 25% area are getting darker and lighter as I move the slider. Same thing is going to happen with the shadows, except they're going to be down here in the three-quarter tone which is approximately 75% black. So if I move it this way, it's going to get lighter in just that area. And if I go the other way, it's going to get darker in just that area. So now we've identified the blacks are over here, shadows are over here, highlights are here, and whites are here. Which means that based simply on this example, it's not correct, but for you to understand that based on this example, that means that exposure, which is the only one left, actually affects the midtones and the 50% grays. Notice how right in that area it gets lighter and darker. Now the reason that this isn't 100% accurate is because if I pull this exposure down by a lot, notice the whites just start getting gray until the whole image gets really, really dark or the whole image gets really, really light. However, simply because of my analogy that I'm trying to share with you, if this is blacks and this is shadows and this is highlights and this is whites, that must mean that exposure affects your 50% gray, which it does. So if you were to move this exposure brighter, you can compensate for the shift in these lighter and darker areas by adjusting the shadows and the highlights. So I can pull the shadows down a little bit more and I can pull the highlights down a little bit more. So notice that by opening up the exposure in the grays, I can bring down the lights and shadows and compensate for it. So now let's change images so that you can see how this works 
with a regular image. As I said previously, in order to fix these quarter tones of value, we're going to grab the highlights and we're going to bring them down. And that's going to put the detail back in. So now understand that if all your sliders are right here in the middle, going to the left is going to make everything darker. Going to the right is going to make everything lighter. So if I take the highlights and bring them to the left, it's going to darken that area. If I wanted to open up the detail inside of her hair, the way that I would do that is to brighten the shadows by sliding it to the right. And then I would put the blacks back in by pushing the blacks to the left. And if I do a before and after, here's before and here's after. What a huge difference just by making a few simple slider corrections. Okay, so let's work on another image. This image has a little bit more wrong with it, so let's try and improve it. What's the first thing that seems wrong with this image to you? To me, it seems that I need to boost the contrast a little bit. The blacks are flat and the whites are flat, and everything's just kind of muddled in the middle. So I need to improve this contrast. So now you would think that if I want to improve the contrast, I'm going to move the contrast slider. However, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, most cases, I don't even touch the contrast. And here's why. If I was to move this contrast slider, we know that going one way is going to make the image brighter, and the other way is going to make the image darker. But watch what actually happens when you have this tonal range in front of you. When I boost this contrast, do you see what just happened? Basically, what it's doing is it's taking the blacks and making them blacker, and it's taking the whites and making them whiter. While that does add contrast, it's grabbing from both ends at the same time and pushing them to a further extreme. Notice how the white is getting whiter and the dark is getting darker, but there is no control to it. Either, either they're going together or they're not. The way that I prefer to work is to have independent controls between the blacks and the whites. Because I don't necessarily want them to move together. I may want one or the other. So to do this, I'm going to take these whites and I'm going to brighten them up and manually add contrast in the whites. I'm also going to manually add contrast in the blacks independent of the whites. Now just that subtle shift already makes a big difference to the image. So by and large, that fixed the tonal problems with the image. If I wanted to, I can open up the exposure a little bit more maybe, but then I definitely need to put some more blacks back in. But then I can pull back on the whites because that got a little too blown out over here, and maybe a little bit in the shadows. But you get the basic idea. At this point, all I did was correct the tone, not the color. So when you look at this image, what's the next thing that's wrong with it? The color. The color is adjusted up here with the temperature and the tint. This is actually pretty straightforward when you think about it. If I take the temperature and I go to the left, it makes the image bluer. And put it to the right, it's going to make it warmer or orange. Below that, with the tint, is going to take it to the left, making it more green, and take it to the right and that's going to make it more magenta. So here's how it actually works. Mostly you're going to be making your changes using the temperature and then fine tune it with the tint. So if I take this temperature and I adjust this image which is too blue already and too cool, I'm going to warm it up by sliding it here. And I can fine tune that by using the tint. And you can sit here and you can slide it around to your heart's content until you get just the right color. But there is a little shortcut in order to balance your whites. Up here at the top, we have this first eyedropper that's called the white balance tool. If I click on that and I can click anywhere I want to, and it's going to balance the image based off of the point that I click on. So for example, if I click on this white, it did this to the image, which may or may not be correct. I can click here. It's going to change the image based off of the values that were under here. 
which I think is a better starting point than over here was. If you want to click on blues and greens and everything else, you certainly can. Just note that the image is going to get a little wacky. Basically, your goal here is to find something that works as a nice beginning point, and you can fine-tune it afterwards using this. And for what it is, I think this is just fine. And depending on your monitor, this may or may not be the best look for you. So now that we've adjusted the tone and we've adjusted the color, the only things that are left in this first panel are clarity, vibrance, and saturation. I'm going to skip clarity for a moment and talk about vibrance and saturation instead. Saturation, by definition, is going to boost all colors equally. Meaning if I crank this all the way up, all the colors are going to get brighter. And the higher you go, the more distorted the color will become. And if I happen to go the other way, that takes out all the color and makes it a black and white. Vibrance is similar, but still a bit different. By definition, vibrance is going to boost the weakest colors. Meaning it's going to take the colors with the least amount of saturation and boost those first. And any other colors are going to come afterwards. However, I find through trial and error, that a better way of understanding saturation versus vibrance is that saturation is going to boost the warms before the cools, and vibrance is going to boost the cools before the warms. So let me show you. If I take saturation, I boost that up, what's the first thing that starts to go? It's the skin, these warms, these orangey areas. However, the first thing that starts to go with vibrance is the cools long before these warms start kicking in. Notice this. Okay. The other thing to notice is if I take the saturation and I boost it up, what it's going to do is it's going to start pushing these warms really far, really fast. Notice that here I am only at around 50, 40 to 50, and the arm is already too much. However, if I take the vibrance, I can boost this up much, much higher. So we're up here around 90 before things start getting really oversaturated. So um, often I'll try and do vibrance first. Uh, because it has more control, but not always. Don't get me wrong. There's a time that I want the warms as opposed to the cools, or the cools as opposed to the warms. So I simply take it as the image requires. But in this case, it's the hair that I want boosted, so I have to grab the cools, which is the blue, and punch that a little bit more. But I can only go so far because I'm grabbing too much of these other colors as well. Last thing I want to talk about is clarity. Now what clarity is actually going to do is it's going to add contrast and sharpening to the image. So notice if I take the clarity and I crank this all the way up, the entire image got darker, brighter, and sharper. Let me zoom in close for you. And as you can see by cranking it, that's what it does. Now, when used on a female image, like beauty or fashion or something, clarity is like the last thing you want to do because it's going to add this gritty tone to it and this grungy look that is definitely not what you want a beautiful woman to have. However, clarity is often used on men when they want to give a man a really manly look, a little bit of a deeper tone to him and give him that grittier look. However, it's often overused. It's used to the point of just being odd in some cases. And I want to show you an example of that. Now, I was once in the bookstore a few months ago, and I noticed two of the same magazine up on the shelf next to each other. One was the American version, and one was the European version. Otherwise, it was the same magazine. What they did was they took an image from the same shoot but had two completely different retouchers do it. So I want to show you how extreme this can get. So this first image, I took a picture while it was up on the stand, and this is the American version. Okay? When you look at it, there's nothing particularly interesting about it. It's a guy, he's standing there, general magazine cover. You look at it, okay, pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Now here's to show you the European version whether it be the style that's more prominent there, or simply the retoucher, or the retoucher that had a style that was a lot different. However, whatever the reason, here's what they ended up with. Now look at how totally and completely different the European version is as opposed to the American version. And the biggest difference here is the cranking of that clarity, which is why I brought this up. Here the American image was simply cleaned up and used, 
and the European version was completely retouched. And again, that's with the clarity that gives it that deep, gritty look and adds more contrast to it. Now, that's not to say that one is better than the other or whatever. It's just simply stating that it is different. And I'm pointing out which tool was used to achieve that look.